So Damon asked me if I could do a presentation about async in .NET Core. Uh, so I said, yeah, why not? And uh, well, I have quite a bit of practice in uh, async, uh, C sharp, and that stuff because I, I work for a company called Particular Software most of the time, and we are the makers of Ansible Bus, which is basically an open source um, li licensed uh, slash commercial uh, service bus solution for .NET applications. So we manage roughly a, a thousand customers worldwide. We have also customers in Switzerland. Uh, whenever uh, customers do messaging on top of Azure Service Bus, Azure Storage Queues. Amazon SQS, SQL Server, RabbitMQ, whatever, we basically help them out so that they can focus on writing business logic and not need to write a plumbing code that does all the transaction handling and all that stuff. And obviously that's all async because it's an IOVAM domain. So uh, that's what I do for a living and that's where mo most of the async uh, best practices are coming from. So um, what I thought is because uh, we are all engineers, we like to see code. So I, I try to avoid slides now in this presentation. And it should also be kind of a um, question and answer type of st style. So if, you're, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I have a few samples with me, but I don't necessarily need to go through all of them. I mean, that's really just a relaxed setting. So if we lose some time on something that you want to clarify, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. I think at the end it's more important that everyone understands the, the basic stuff and sees a few things that might enlighten them instead of everyone has seen all the samples and then we're like, wow, cool, but I don't understand anything. Okay? So, one of Async in .NET Core, so why is that relevant? Well, uh, you probably know that uh, there is the task-based API and the, the TPL, so the task parallel library in .NET and the system friendly task object that has been introduced around the .NET 4.0 area. And at some point, uh, Microsoft basically wrote some language extensions uh, into the compiler. These are the async the wait keywords. And those async await keywords allow us to write uh, code uh, without having to have Christmas tree and continuation uh, stuff. So maybe you remember this, you had to write something like uh, task.continue with, continue with, continue with, and at some point you were like, I'm super smart, I'm doing conditional continuation. So you could then pass in some enums and say, well, only when faulted, only when completed, and all that kind of stuff. And at some point, uh, three months later, you looked at your code and you were like, holy shit, what did I do here? You don't understand it anymore. And now with the async and await keyword, basically all this hassle is gone and we can just uh, declare uh, the async and await uh, keywords in a pretty uh, simple manner. So the demo that I'm going to use is here. So we have a console application. Uh, we have uh, the, the threads uh, on the top here. And here is the repository if you're interested, github.com slash tanimarbach slash async .NET Core and the things that I'm saying, the things I'm showing on the screen is also in the readme in that repository if you want to recap uh, this, uh, this stuff. So let's start uh, with the first one, the sync uh, over async. Can you still see me if I sit down? Yeah, yeah it's all good. Okay, good. Okay, so <clears throat> let's, le let's, have, let's have a look at some code. So what I usually hear is when, uh, when people are doing async await, uh, especially in legacy applications, like, yeah, but I can't go async all the way, right? One of the most important rules is async all the way. You probably have heard that. Uh, and then they say, well, can't I just uh, do a blocking call somewhere? Well, the, the thing is, if you look at uh, the code, uh, hopefully you can see this, sync over async. I will zoom in a little. I'll move this away. Okay, so I have here a sample, a sync over async, and these are all the variations of how people are doing uh, out there uh, sync over async. So the idea is that they're saying, well, I can't really ripple through, uh, through all the call stacks, so at some point I will just do a, a blocking call. So what they do is they have some kind of an async operation. This async operation does something. So it uh, calls to some, some async API. And then they say, well, I, I'm just going to, this even returns a string. And they say, well, I'm just going to do dot result. And they, they wrap it in a task.run, for example. So this, this code here, what it does is essentially, because we do dot result, what it does, it blocks, right? So we didn't really gain much. 
because, uh, well, the idea of async await is that whenever we have an await keyword somewhere in the code, we want to give the threat that is entering into this code an opportunity to do something else. Right? That's, that's what makes async code super scalable, because we're not blocking any threat. And because we're not blocking any threat, what it means is one thread can handle hundreds, thousands, multiple thousands of uh, requests concurrently, and we don't need to expand in parallelism, which is super nice. Um, so, but here, if you do dot result, what's going to happen is that the thread that goes into that method essentially is blocked. And now here, some people are saying, well, I'm going to be smart, because maybe you have heard of the thing that is called context capturing. So when you have an await keyword somewhere, uh, by default, if you don't write dot configure await false, uh, what's going to happen is the context is captured. In a, what is a context environment? A contextual environment is, for example, Windows Forms or WPF. In Windows Forms or WPF, you have a, a thing called synchronization context or dispatcher synchronization context. That's the thing that renders your UI. Right? On Windows, we are in a single-threaded apartment. The single-threaded apartment means only one thread is allowed to do stuff on the UI. So that means whenever you want to, uh, to put something on some UI element, probably setting a text property, you have to do this on the UI thread. So that's why the default state machine that is generated under the hood makes it really easy for WPF for Windows Forms developer to just write await, and then after the await, you can do textbox.text, and everything is fine, you don't have to worry about synchronization. That's pretty cool, but it can be a hindrance because some, whenever you don't write uh, the configure await false, what's going to, to happen is the thread that um, did something else, we can, we can do some, uh, some other thread, but then the continuation, which is the code after the await statement, will be marshaled back to the user <coughs> interface. So that means Every await statement that we have in a call stack when we don't write configure await false will capture the context and try to remarshal back to the single thread department. So that means in a Windows Forms application, WPF application, if you have a lot of await statements without configure await false, we're essentially always trying to rejoin and then there is the thing that they call death of a thousand paper cuts. Because when you have multiples of those, you, you block slightly the user interface thread and you might see sluggish applications. And then people are pretty creative. They're saying, <coughs> I can avoid this problem by just wrapping this, uh, this async operation with a toss.run. Toss.run, as a repetition, in case you, you don't remember anymore, is actually a method that was written to offload CPU-bound operations to the work thread pool. Okay? What does that mean? Well, a CPU-bound operation is, for example, an algorithm like, for example, bubble sort, quick sort, or whatever sorting algorithm that is bound to the data that is already available in memory and that can benefit from parallelism. What algorithm can benefit from parallelism is all the algorithms that can basically be divided into multiple chunks and then we can go off to multiple threads to parallelize things and then join together all the sort results. You should only be using task.run if you want to explicitly offload CT bound operations. So here we already violate sort of these best practices because this method returns a task, we wrap it in task or run to explicitly offload. But people do this because they want to avoid context capturing. But now what we do is essentially uh, task or run goes on the default schedule, which is the worker thread pool. Then we go into this method, we do something async. So we return the thread that we acquired, but then we need an additional thread to basically um, that, so we block the thread that is coming here and we need an additional thread to essentially uh, unlock uh, the method uh, to reschedule the continuation of this method. So what we did here is we actually made everything worse. So we have here with this code a problem that is called thread starvation. So instead of using, if this code here would be completely synchronous, so if we had not a do async operation, but just a do operation that returns a string, it would be more efficient, even if this method takes two or three seconds, to just call that synchronous, synchronous operation instead of trying to fake something around an asynchronous operation which turn, returns a string, and then doing this kind of uh, trickery surrounding it. Because with the sync version, we block one thread. With the sync over async version that we have here, we essentially block two threads. 
And that means, I'm not sure if you're familiar with how the worker fret pool works. So the worker fret pool um, has a sort of a, a hill climbing algorithm. So it basically um, increases the capacity of the worker fret pool by provisioning on demand more frets to work on the things that it needs to do. And that provisioning of more frets, it takes a lot of time, it takes memory. And it's a basically stop the world operation. So the more we get want to schedule things on, on the worker thread pool, the more memory we need, the more we need to ramp up, and the more resource intensive it gets. And well, guess what? Because we by default block here, um, here uh, two threads, we made this thing uh, much worse. Then you see things like, uh, well, well, another problem here, sorry, I forgot to mention this, is dot result dot wait throws an aggregate exception, which is not the actual exception that you want to see. Then people get really creative. They say, let's avoid the, the context caption, but let's avoid the aggregate exception. Let's do get the way to get result, which unwraps the actual aggregate exception, gets the, gets the uh, inner exception, and refrows that inner exception. So now we've solved the problem of uh, the exception throwing, but still we have the sync over async problem. And then you see all kinds of uh, crazy shit. Uh, like, for example, toss.run dot result dot result. Again, here we would make it even worse. We would throw an aggregate exception containing an aggregate exception containing the actual exception. So that's probably not code that you, you want to write for your customers. Um, I'm going to not I'm going to not talk about this. You can have a look at it uh, later. But then uh, the worst is actually this this variation here. So when you say well, I'm too lazy to have, I want to have a synchronous path and an asynchronous uh, path, but I'm too lazy to write the synchronous path redundant. So I'm just going to write the async path and then I do get the way to get result because wow, it will unwrap the exception and everything will be fine. Well, no, not everything will be fine. Again, we're blocking, uh, we're, we're exposed to threat starvation, but here, if you're in a context environment, we actually deadlock all the things. Do you know why? I can prove it to you that it deadlocks, if you don't believe me. And you can think about why. <laughs> My presentation is done. I can go home, did my job. It will never end. So what's going to happen is if this code is executed in a, in a contextual environment that it is here wrap, wrap in context, so I fake the synchronization context that only has one thread. So what's going to do is we go into this async operation. We dive into uh, this code. We go into await task delay. Uh, into the weights uh, thing, it captures the context, which is the <coughs> current task scheduler, which is the one that is associated with the synchronization context, which only has one thread. Then we release that, we go up, and then we say, now my dear friend, go sleep forever. Because the thing is, we don't have resources anymore to schedule the continuation because we just captured the current task scheduler and we cannot do anything else. And the same happens with this variation here, is if you do task.wait, even if you provide here, uh, for example, a timeout of one second or, or whatever arbitrary second that you're going to choose, if you want to get the actual result and not an aggregate exception, then even here we would deadlock again because we're capturing the threat. Okay? So sync over async, evil, 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 don't use it. So it's better that you just go ahead and basically just write your synchronous API, stick to those synchronous APIs. If you don't have time in your customer's project to write the async APIs, then don't do it. Stick to the sync ones. Yes, you're blocking a threat. It's, it's less resource intensive. But if you have the opportunity and you're saying, well, we're writing a backend application, ASP.NET Core, ASP.NET Web API, whatever that supports async and you have async APIs, then do it async all the way. So start with the controller, for example, and 
yes, it's viral, but stick to the async keyword and, and pipe it through the whole call stack. Okay? Any questions? What if you have to do it? Like console application that has a, a sync library. Console application? Where you, you can't, the console is sync, the autons, uh -huh. but then you're using only async. So okay. you have to do. Okay. What should you do then? Okay. You know the choice. Okay, good. So um, that's a really good question. So what we can say is in a console application, we are in a context free environment, which is only the task scheduler, the default is around, which is only the worker for Red pool. In that case, if you just do it on the top level, which is the console, the main entry point, it's fine. Okay. But the thing is, um, the conceptual thing that you need to uh, save in your, in your brain is synchronization is a top level concern and top level means it's the entry point concern, okay, which is the console because only the entry point knows the contextual environment it's being exposed to. Therefore the code that is written in there should not make any assumptions. So it should just stick to the best practices if it's async await and just write await, configure await false configure rate false if it's uh, not the context if it doesn't need access to the context and then on the top level you can say well I'm in a console application I know there is no context therefore I can do get the waiter get result and then I would use get the waiter dot get result okay yes every rule comes with an exception but if you can stick to the best practices and go all sync async all the way to avoid those uh, deadlocks any other questions in the, the configure await false in the WPF um, application, you would just do on on the first call, you would do configure await true, uh -huh. which is default, and then on the, uh, I would say, in the APIs in the back, you would do all the way configure await false. Okay, that's a really interesting question. So, um, in an ideal world, okay, if you have separations of concerns, um, you should only access user interface stuff in your view models when you're doing MVVM, right? So I would say all the code that you're calling, if it's good structured code, is probably some type of a library, type of framework-ish code that doesn't need access to the user interface, okay? So in that case, what you can say is that all the, so I would do something like that, this. You, we are in the view model, right? And then you have, you do await um, my method, here and then I would on this level I would not write configure wait false right and then you have like public async task my uh, method method and then <coughs> here on this level you have await uh, deeper down oh, and then I would write configure wait false here yeah. And then deeper down yeah. as configure wait false. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because the good thing is now you're basically all the continuations and basic continuations is this this stuff here is uh, is not uh, scheduled back to yeah. the user interface thread. Therefore, you're not having that uh, that death of a thousand paper cut uh, kind of stuff. Obviously, that requires you to have good separations of concern, and not all the time you have this right. Mm -hmm. Another thing is also people say, well, async await is viral. I hate it. Um, that it is true, it is viral, but again, if you're applying the good old design principles of separations of concern, you probably also want to, to basically separate the side effect occurring stuff from the non-side effect occurring stuff. And IO stuff, where async await really shines, which is uh, socket access, HTTP client access, and all that type of stuff, um, is uh, you want to separate it, right? Because, uh, and then if you do that, you can say, well, I have here my IO path, so I load my stuff from the files, from the database, whatever, and then I make my business decisions, and that, that business decision type of code doesn't need to be easy to wait, right? It can be filtering stuff in memory, blah, 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 and then you save stuff back into the database, which is on the higher levels, again, can be async again, right? So if you apply good, let's say object-oriented practices and separations of concern, or you could even say functional programming styles where you separate uh, side effect occurring stuff, you end up having a more cleaner API and you don't need to ripple this async await keyword through everything. Okay, does that help? Yep. Good. Yes. The beginner question is, if I have 
two async, uh, two awaits method, whatever, uh -huh. without the configure await, just await, blah blah, await, blah blah. Where on which level? In within this method. With, within this method. Twice that without the uh, configure await. Without the yeah. configure await. Okay. What actually happens? What does the await do? Is it a synchronization of async or? Uh, it's uh, all a simple. Do I do the first one? Do the second one? And then the yes. Wait? Okay. So when as uh, it's a very good question. So sorry, I assumed that that's already known. Um, I ha I'm happily uh, clarifying this. So what if you have the wait keyword here? It's basically sequential execution. But what you're saying is, do this. Allow the current thread to do some other stuff. When this thing is done call me back and execute the continuation which is this code so but it's, it's completely sequential right we have we don't have explicit concurrency at all right it's just a do this do this if this throws an exception the state machine will properly handle the exception wrap it in a task rethrow it and bubble it up the call stack so you can stick to all your good c sharp practices like wrapping stuff in using statements uh, doing try catches, try finalies, and all the uh, all that stuff. Okay, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, but important is configure await false. Conceptually, only affects on this level. It affects this code. Okay, it doesn't affect this code, which is a kind of mind blowing, but unfortunately, that's how it works. Good. Then let's look at, because you're going to write a lot of uh, amazing async code with your customers, right? Uh, let's have a look at how a good citizen uh, would look like. So um, I have this code here. It has a cancellation token source. It has a task delay which with, with from days one. So it, this would basically uh, release the threat, but the code would only continue to execute after one day. Uh, and then I wrap it here with with cancellation. Ignore this. This is not important. And then I print end. And then I do the same thing. I have here this cancel after method uh, with two seconds. Do the task. De do the task de delay. So what what I'm trying to show here. So I have a piece of code which tries to basically summarize all the best practices uh, that you're going to to be using out there. So. Let's, let's suppose you want to write this method, and it's a truly async method. So what we want to do is we return task, or task of t result, or value task, or value task of t result. I will potentially talk about value ta uh, task a bit more uh, if I have more, more time. Uh, but we never use async void. Async void is evil, forget it. You only use async void in uh, event click handlers on the UI. Everywhere else, I never want to see it. If you write code with async void, you're doomed. Why are you doomed? Async void from a caller perspective is a fire and forget method. Any exception that happens in there cannot be captured by the infrastructure. It will not even trigger the task unobserved exception, task factory unobserved exception. And they can pull down the opt-domain. Okay? So you don't want to be uh, woken up by your customer in the middle of the night and saying the server crashes, and then you find out that someone wrote this async, uh, async void stuff, okay? Whenever you stick to async task, so async task is the new void in the uh, async world, then you're gonna be fine, okay? And then we accept the cancellation token .NET implements the concept of corporative cancellation. Corporative cancellation means it's a best effort. Okay? Any API that allows to be cancelled should accept the cancellation token. If you're writing code that has to be semant semantically versioned or whatever, you can already have an overload that accepts cancellation token even if you don't yet implement it. That's fine. Corporative cancellation means well, give me the token. When I can cancel, I will happily do it. If I can't, I will not. And I will decide as an implementer of that method when I will be canceling that, that stuff, okay? And then what you can do is, well, if we accept the cancellation token from the outside, we're basically giving the caller of this method the opportunity to cancel stuff, okay? But maybe, we internally in our implementation, we want to have some kind of an SLA because we're saying 
well, let's for example here, I'm saying whatever the, the user provides me, at maximum I want to wait 10 seconds because it doesn't make sen sense to wait longer than 10 <coughs> seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. That would be the SLA, for example, of this method. Then what you can do is you can create linked token sources. Cancellation token sources are a construct that basically manage a cancellation token and can cancel a token that is linked to that cancellation token source. Important is, if you have a cancellation token source that has a cancel after method, or a time span in the constructor of the cancellation token source, you always need to wrap it in a using statement. Why is that? Internally, it allocates a system threading timer. System threading timer is a resource that needs to be uh, disposed. If you're not disposing it, you have memory leaks. Uh, because the timers will hang around for the lifetime of the opt-domain, okay? So wrap it in using statement. I'm using here the new C-sharp 8 feature because it's so fancy. And then, for example, if you have interop code, uh, for example, you want to interop with something that throws events but doesn't really provide an async API, you can use this handy thing. It's called task completion source. A task completion source is basically a task that you control the outcome of the task. So you can set it to cancelled, you can set it to, um, to uh, throwing an exception, you can set it to completed. That's in your hands. If you have a task completion source, always provide the run continu continuation asynchronously uh, thing to it. Why is that? When a task completion source completes, by default, it will execute uh, the completion. So here we have the task completion source task. So it will execute the continuation of this task, which is this part, on the thread that sets the task completion source. This can lead to deadlocks, the default behavior. Because the .NET Framework can't do breaking changes, although it's a really bad design, they introduced this enum, and it's unfortunately your responsibility to know this special case and to, to write it. But Keep in mind, when you're using somewhere task completion source, you want to write this enum into the constructor, if, and you need .NET 4.6.1 at least as a target framework in order to work. .NET Core has it out of the box, okay? Then, well, what you can do is you can register, uh, on, for example, on tokens, you can register things that get triggered when the token gets canceled. These are the these registrations. Always dispose those registrations because, again, you will memory leak if you don't. What you can do in there is the code will be triggered when the token gets cancelled. What does it mean for our code? So what we can say is if the user passes a token and because we have a linked token source here, it will be either cancelled when the user cancels this token or after 10 seconds. So either when the user cancels or after 10 seconds, this code here will be executed. Okay, and then we can set, for example, task completion sources and all that stuff. Also important, uh, this use synchronization context false. Again, if you're writing library code or framework code, we want to set this use synchronization context uh, to false, because then we're not capturing the context again. Okay, and then you can use your regular uh, await statement uh, and and all that all that type of stuff. So let me briefly execute uh, this code so that you can see uh, what the, what the effects of this are. Well, obviously we're not going to wait the day because now we will uh, we will run into the default SLA of the method, which is 10 seconds the first time, and then the second time I will sh I will I will show it briefly so that you can remember it. It just takes two seconds because um, we said, sorry, I'm going to scroll up. We said the token should be canceled in two seconds. Right? The first time we didn't provide anything on the token source, so it will use the default SLA of this method, which we implemented. The second time, we as users told it to cancel in two seconds uh, instead of a day, so it will only take uh, two seconds. So I also wrote down uh, what I just told you. Uh, I, I wrote uh, some of, th of those uh, best practices down. Uh, you, can also, uh, you, re you can also read it up uh, in, in, my, uh, in the README on the repository. One thing that I forgot uh, to mention is uh, the two last uh, points. 
is, well, async await is not a silver bullet, right? So if you have entity framework stuff that goes to the database or HTTP client calls that take five seconds, the async code also takes five seconds. If your DB query takes five seconds, the async code also takes five seconds, right? It's no magic silver bullet uh, fairy dust that you can sprinkle over your code. The only difference that we have between the synchronous version and the asynchronous version is we're not blocking a thread in those five seconds, which obviously makes this code much more scalable, especially on, on servers and the backgrounds and especially in the cloud, right? In the cloud, we are in the area of penny pinching and basically Microsoft executes the code that we write on our behalf. That's why they want us to write asynchronous code. That's why all the Azure SDKs and everything is async because we're not, then we're not uh, wasting the data center resources that they provide for us, okay? And uh, what I also want to say, which is, comes back to your question, uh, if you can, I would, I would strongly encourage you to stick to sequential execution and no explicit concurrency. What do I mean with this? Um, let me briefly explain this. This is sequential, non-explicit, this is sequential execution of code, and there is no concurrency, no explicit concurrency in this code. Well, there is concurrency in the perspective of the threading model and everything, okay? But this code will always execute in this order, period, right? And we don't have to worry about sharing of resources like local fields, local counters. We don't have to worry about resolving something from the IOC container and maybe having some weird scope and then we have different behaviors depending where we resolve stuff. Explicit concurrency is when we write code like this, task when all, for example, and we say, I am smart and even smarter, okay? If you're saying we have two methods, I am smart and uh, even smarter, that do something async and we're saying, well, I want to make this faster, right? Why is it faster? Because what's going to happen is those two things will run concurrently and then we join together and then we sequentially execute the next part of here. Yes, yeah, so if this takes five seconds and if this takes five seconds, so in the best case, instead of taking 10 seconds of sequentially executing things, it now takes five seconds, five-ish seconds, right? That's nice. But now what we have is we opted in for explicit concurrency, and probably you've heard it, concurrency, parallelism, threading is super hard, and it's hard to debug and everything. So please, if you can, stick to the simple sequential execution. There is no difference between async await or void calling method or key result returning method. The only difference is you're not blocking a thread, okay? And this is easier to reason about, easier to debug. Only if you have proof, if you uh, measured it, that it's really beneficial to go into the concurrency land, into the danger zone or dragon zone, only then please go, go there, okay? I'm a big fan of keep the code simple and stupid if you can. Any questions so far? Are you still with me? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Um, <coughs> I, I have an hour, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So um, let's, have a, let's have a look uh, quickly at uh, unobserved exceptions uh, to repeat some of the things that I already uh, said. So if you stick to task returning APIs, um, then unobserved exceptions, if you're not awaiting a task like here, will be raised to task scheduler unobserved exception. So that's your last resort where you can basically handle things, maybe call your logging framework, maybe call app insights or whatever you're going to use, right? And then say, oh my God, we had an exception that we didn't think about, uh, right into the log file. Use Raygun, whatever to uh, preemptively um, call your service staff so that they know this, this happens, and then you can set it to set observed. Because if you set it to set observed, it will not crash the app domain. Important is, and I show this here, this will only be triggered when the garbage collection was, was wrong. So that can take a while. That's why I added here a task delay, 
for demonstration purposes, but I can uh, quickly execute this code. So what we can see is uh, we got the unobserved uh, exception, which is an aggregate exception uh, that happens on the background, and we can actually log it. If we had written this code with async void, we would not be able to, to do this. We would not be able to, uh, to set, set observed. Uh, and therefore, it could, it could pull down the updomain depending on the .NET Framework version that you're, you're running on. Okay. So again, best practices, uh, re uh, recap from before. Async task is the new void, or task of the result is basically the new T result in the async uh, IO bound uh, domain. Cool. So uh, let's have a let's have a look at another thing. So usually when we are, let's say in the framework area or when we inherit code where we have interfaces, abstract classes, where someone said I know this is going to be mostly IO bound, so the interface needs to return a task, or the abstract method returns a task. And now we're coming and we implement that interface, or we inherit from that abstract class, but we're implementing and saying, well, we don't need to do anything, anything IO bound in there. We want to do something synchronous. What do we do? Well, what we can do is we can do it the proper way or the not so proper way. So I have examples here. So uh, unfortunately, uh, what I've seen quite many times is uh, this, this kind of patterns. So they implement uh, this, this, this calculator, which returns a task of int with task.run, and just do a plus b. That's total nonsense, because you're wasting, a, you're wasting an additional worker pool thread for no added benefit. Okay. Another one that I've seen, unfortunately, uh, in the wild, and I was at the customer side where they had it like three or four hundred times in their in their code, uh, because they have some had so many base classes and interfaces that was prepared of someone to be async enabled. They uh, basically did this: await task to yield and then return uh, a plus b. So, do you want me to explain what task to yield is, or is it clear for everyone? Explain. Explain? Yes. Okay. So what task of yield is, it's <coughs> like like thread yield, but for, for tasks. So what it does here is the thread <coughs> that enters goes into that task of yield, sees the task of yield, and basically goes that goes back. And then the continuation is scheduled on on the default task scheduler and immediately picked up by another thread. So the only thing that we do is the thread of execution comes in, and then we say, hey, go, go do some other stuff, but please immediately execute the next thing, okay? But go do some other things. And that's what's, what's going to happen here. So here we essentially made everything, everything worse. It's almost uh, as, as evil as this one. We said, go, go away and come, come back. So we actually lost time, and again, we, we wasted uh, resources. Why yes, is a bad calculator. One calculate bad. If you mean A plus B, you wouldn't do like this. But if it's a long running calculation, you want to have it on the background thread. Okay, so okay, that's a really good, uh, really good um, uh, point that you're throwing in. So, if it's a long running calculation, and you're saying this thing is going to do long running stuff, then what I would advise you to do is write this stuff: class calculator. Then you have a public int calculate late method with the parameters, and then you do stuff here synchronously blocking, and then you you provide the opportunity to the caller of you to say, "Oh, this takes a long time. I want to offload it to the worker thread pool." Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what? I, so offloading and Parallelism should not be the concern of the implementation. It should be the concern of the one that is calling you. If you do correct separation of concerns. Okay. Because the good thing is, the caller essentially knows that, well, I'm already in a free-threaded context, so I can just call it that. I don't worry if it takes three, three or four seconds. But you as an implementer of this class, you don't. Okay. And the thing is, you also don't know in which context you're going to be executed. So let's say if you use this method here, and now some brilliant user wraps this in a for loop, right? 
Now what's going to happen is that every, every calculate invocation will, will use a fret, which is horribly inefficient. And it's, the thing is, it's not clear to the, to the user that is calling you, because by default, task returning API from an API from an API perspective should be truly async. Therefore, they should not be using tasks that run. Okay. Of course, in the wild, if you're writing applications, these this separations cannot always be done. The only thing that I, w I want you to think about is think about this problem and make explicit decisions in your code. So, and it should be clear for everyone. Because we know code evolves over time and you probably will not be there at some point in the project and then people will do stupid stuff and then this code here will waste resources, okay? So what we can say is the correct way of doing this is if the interface is task returning and we have no way to change it because it's provided by third party library or for some framework that we have, then we do task from result, which wraps this A plus B in an already completed task. And that's a synchronous implementation. If, if the, the, the implementer or the provider of this API uh, was smart and thought about uh, efficient, um, low allocation uh, type of use cases, then you could be returning a valid task of type int and then just do A plus B. I'm going to talk about value task if you have time a bit later. Uh, that's a new type that could introduce. But that would be uh, another, another way of, uh, of doing it. Okay? I mean, the demo is super boring, right? It's just calculate stuff, so it's, it's not really, uh, it's not really uh, interesting. Okay, cool. So, any questions about this? No. Okay, so... Um, Let's, get, let's go into, um, into uh, stack traces. So one of the great things that we got from, from uh, .NET Core is uh, when one of the problems we have with async await is if you write async await, uh, the stack traces, especially if you throw exception, get quite large, right? Because we have this async state machinery that is uh, created by the by the compiler, and if you have the debug symbols and everything around, we basically get a huge stack trace. Because we, don't, we have the wait code, which is our code, and then we have all the compiler-generated craft in between, which is usually three or four uh, stack frames wide, and that happens for every await statement. So we had cases with our customers where basically the actual exception was hidden in 120 lines of async, async state machinery, which is, which is horrible, right? A lot of users complained, and in the .NET Core, uh, they did uh, stack trace uh, improvements. So what we have now is when we execute um, new stack traces, they basically now look like this. Cleaned up, and no more async state machinery there, and just the actual code that gets executed. And we don't have to worry about this anymore. So that's one of the big benefits that we get uh, from, from .NET Core. Maybe you have out there in your code, uh, there were some libraries that uh, allowed you to clean the stack trace. There were extension methods that people have been using. So with .NET Core, that's, uh, that's no longer needed. But you need .NET Core 2.1, at least, as a, as a runtime, uh, to, get, uh, to get this uh, benefit. Some people... Um, try to be uh, smart and uh, they try to optimize stuff by shortcutting the state machine. I briefly show you this. Um, what does shortcutting the state machine mean? Is shortcutting the state machine means if you try to avoid the async and the wait keywords. You can do this if your method that returns a task has one or two exit points, right? Because if, if you have one exit point that is task base uh, here, for example, and it's the last one, you can, instead of writing async await, you can just return the task. If you omit these keywords, the compiler will not generate the <coughs> state machine. Async await is just syntactic sugar, uh, like I uh, explained at the beginning. So then we don't have the stack trace problem. That's nice. And it's a bit more efficient in high-performance scenarios 
because the, sta uh, the, um, the, the state machine that is generated basically um, uh, does closure, so some type of closure allocations because it creates uh, nested classes that have fields and it tries to basically put the state into those classes and carry it on and all that type of stuff. So people have been trying to opt out from, from the state machine. The problem is this code is less evolvable. Why is it less evolvable? Well, uh, depending how we structure the code, once we have more than two exit points, we anyway have no way of opting out from this anymore. And the problem is also, in this type of code, it's pretty easy to write code uh, like this. And depending on which compiler version, uh, for example, you, it's pretty easy to write code like this, task to complete the task. And this fulfills, essentially, the method implementation because we return a task, but what we forgot is that we have here something else that returns a task, but we're not awaiting it. And now we have a bug in our code because potentially we wanted to have to await it, right? So it's really easy to screw up things if you stick to this pattern. Right? And that's why um, really, really only in really high performance scenarios you can use this trickery. I would, in most line of business applications, in most type of code, uh, this is not going to be your problem. It's probably your database access and all the other types of stuff. So stick to the async await keywords because then you have compiler help, compiler warnings if you forget to await something and you need to opt out. So that's safe. And plus, you don't have nasty surprises like this one. So when you, f when you return a task and you throw an exception, but you don't add the async keyword, the task will be thrown on the synchronous path and will not be wrapped into the task and be rethrown. What does that mean? Well, if you think about this, we're doing explicit concurrency because we're not awaiting this task. We would essentially think that this call code falls through here and is done, but it does not. I can demonstrate this to you. Um, Once it's executed, uh, it uh, should be the last line. Actually, the invalid operation exception is thrown is thrown to the caller, which is something really surprisable. If you add the async keyword, that problem is solved. It's properly uh, it's properly uh, wrapped into the task and properly uh, uh, rethrown. And also, many people, like I said, did this for optimization, but in the .NET Core and .NET Core, especially .NET Core 2.1, they did quite a lot of optimizations in the lower level state machine that is generated for you, together with the Rosling team. Uh, there are runtime optimizations, Rosling optimizations, which means is that if you stick to the ASIC await keyword, with every .NET Core version that is coming out, you probably get optimizations anyway that you don't need to worry about it. So stick to the safe stuff, okay? Good. So um, let's look at um, some some cool stuff that is coming uh, with uh, C sharp eight and with in terms of uh, async await. So you probably already have heard that C sharp eight will be tied to .NET Core basically. So uh, Microsoft will stop backporting stuff to the full framework. So if you want to like benefit <coughs> from the latest and uh, greatest C sharp eight uh, improvements, you have to be, you have to be running on uh, .NET Core. Here, uh, I'm using the, the latest uh, preview. I think it's preview five uh, the, that I'm using. And uh, once you have .NET Core uh, preview five and or the latest preview, you also get C-Sharp 8 support. You set it in your CS proj and then you can use the new stuff that is, the, that is uh, coming, coming there. So one thing that we get is, which I think is uh, pretty cool, Microsoft realized that, well, they say, don't do uh, sync over async, right? We talked about this, but now we have stuff like disposable, where you need to implement a disposable, and then you have problems like this. For example, you have something that is, has an async API and only has an async API, and then you need to implement disposable because ethics cop tells you or whatever, or your coding guidelines that your customer tells you. Um, then what you need to do is, when when you need to do stuff in the dispose, you need to do get the way to get resolved, right? And we just learned this is evil. We shouldn't be doing that. So the only 
The only way uh, you can solve this if you don't have C sharp 8 is you have to have a, syn a synchronous API. Here with streams, we're lucky because, of course, this, this example is a bit made up, right? I could just call flush and everything is nice. But if we don't have this luxury, well, then we can only do get the way to get result, and now we are in the threat uh, wasting scenario. But with C sharp 8, what we can do is we can implement I async disposable together with I disposable if we want to, or just, just I async disposable. With I async disposable, um, well, we have this dispose async method, which returns a value task, and in here, we can do async stuff. And with C-sharp 8, um, well, how this code is then going to look like is we can, <laughs> which is a bit weird and counterintuitive uh, from the first beginning, but we can say await using and then disposable. And then here it will be asynchronously disposed. And now if we want to opt out from context capturing, we have to write, as you can see here, on the, if something implements an I, dis, uh, I async disposable, right after the declaration of the I async disposable, we do dot configure await false to configure context capturing. Quiz question so that you don't fall asleep. Why do we have to write this here? Dot configure await false. Hint, hint, hint. What is a using statement? What does the compiler generate? Finally. Correct. So where will the await statement be for the dispose async? Yeah, wait, uh, finally. Correct. Okay. So that means the code that is coming after the finally is this code down here, right? Okay. So, but because this code is not in our control, it's generated by the compiler. We need to be able to tell the compiler, hey, please, for the continuation that is triggered after the await dispose async in the finally block that you create, please opt out from context capturing. Okay? That's why we have to write it here. Okay? And then, of course, we can just use this again, super boring demo, right? Um, we just dispose stuff. And by the way, some of the types, I couldn't remember this, that's why I had to write it down. Some of the types uh, already implement IAs in disposable in the .NET, uh, in the .NET Core 3.0. So that's, uh, that's already uh, done, done, done for you. So that's nice. Or you can start leveraging uh, that type of stuff if you're running on .NET Core, a latest preview, and use uh, C, -sharp, C Sharp 8. Then what they also introduced is a thing called uh, async, async enumerable, which is uh, uh, pretty fancy. Uh, one of the things that we could not do in the previous C-sharp versions is when we had when we returned I enumerable, we could never write in the yield return code, we could never write something like await. That was not possible. Now with C-sharp 8, uh, .NET Core, we can do this. So we can write code like this. We can say, well, let's open Let's open a file, let's open a stream reader, for example, and I have this file, and this file basically just has um, milliseconds in there, right, line by line. And then, uh, sorry. And then what, what it does is it reads the first line asynchronously from the stream reader. And then um, it does cancellation, and then it yield returns the line. And what we have to change here is, in order to be able to declare this async, we need to return i async enumerable instead of i enumerable. And when we have i async enumerable, what we can then write is we can write await for each, and then we can do fancy stuff, right? We get an integer here back. And then, for example, this demo, I'm just reading the line, which is the number of milliseconds, and then uh, I'm awaiting. So the effect of this code is we basically have a stream but pull-based approach in combination with, with, with async. And then this looks like this. I execute it, and we have a 100 millisecond delay, a 200 millisecond delay, 400 millisecond delay, 800, 1600, 
3264 hundred delay and only then we close the file and the stream and everything right but until we are there we keep it open but we're completely asynchronous we're not blocking any threat so that's a really nice thing to do uh, if you're on that on that new version which comes with Donnet Core 3.0 one thing that is a bit weird and I hope they're gonna change it there is all kinds of crazy matching in there like for example you have extension method that say with cancellation where you can provide in a token if you don't want to provide it to the method itself uh, but then you have to basically uh, declare an attribute here which is called enumerator cancellation and then the compiler generated code creates a link token source and all that kind of stuff to link it together uh, and then um, cancel, cancel, uh, cancel this token automatically if this token is cancelled. So we can basically provide two types of token which is super weird. I haven't really seen the use case yet. I think the use case is, is if you're not directly for reaching through it, when you basically uh, push around the enumerator to upper layers so that you always have uh, the, the, the token available. I don't know. Then you also have configure weight false. Again, we write configure weight false here because compiler generates code for us, right? Com uh, does a state machine. So this code gets basically asynchronously sequentially executed within the state machine. So we need to be able to control the, the, the context capturing for that code that is generated by the compiler. So we want to do it on the level of the for each. Okay. Okay. Good. Any questions? Is your, are you, is your brain still here? I hope so. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So, what else? Well, I'm going to quickly look into um, hosted services. That's probably something uh, you're going to stumble upon. So, with, um, with .NET Core uh, and also ASP.NET Core, uh, they had like the, the web host, you probably have used that one before, and now they also have the generic host. The generic host is basically a hosting abstraction for console applications, uh, whatever you want to use. And what they did there is they have some basic helper, async helper classes that uh, are called uh, hosted services that you can uh, opt in if you're interested in. So hosted services, really you have to install Microsoft Extensions hosting as a NuGet package. Uh, the, you, need, you need to have this uh, in, in your CS uh, approach. Let me quickly show you this. This is the one, Microsoft Extension Hosting. Obviously, you need the one that comes with the uh, .NET Core uh, framework that you want to use. Once you have pulled that in, uh, what you can do is hosted services, is you can plug in things into your uh, container into your uh, container here I'm using the service collection provider and then you inherit from either I hosted service or if you want to do something in the background you inherit from background service and then Microsoft does some type of heavy lifting for you so they make sure that the cancellation token is properly observed they make sure that the stuff is offloaded for you and by the way, they also have now a template, which is called worker service that they provide out of the box, which allows you to have um, microservices that do background type of, of work, leveraging this background service pattern. So what this means is uh, the, the generic host will start uh, this code first, then it will run this code in a loop, a loop until the cancellation token uh, is stopped and then stop async is called and then they are also disposed at the end um, and the thing is well we just have to say create host start the host and at some point we stop the host here after five seconds and then the effect will be that we get stuff like this so we have something working in the background for five seconds again it's not blocking any threat it's not wasting any resources we can do low preload stuff we can fill caches whatever we want and uh, that's a really nice uh, pattern uh, to, le to leverage if, you're, if you have the generic host or the web host builder. One important uh, thing that I would like to mention is, um, as far as I know, Microsoft is planning to move also ASP.NET Core, Web API and MVC to the generic host. They're not there yet. They're using the same abstractions, but there is a, a different behavior between the web host and the generic host. 
The different behavior is if you're using the web host and you're starting up a web API and you're using hosted services, what, what, what's happening is the web API gets started concurrently with your hosted services. So what it means is you can serve web requests from your users while your hosted services are still starting. So never make any assumptions when you're using the web host builder about the things that you're doing in your hosted services. So for example, if you're saying, I'm going to fill a cache that will be ready, hot and warm when requests are coming in with web host builder and hosted services, you might be screwed because the cache might not be there yet, right? The there is a different behavior of generic host. Generic host doesn't have that problem. But yet, the official recommendation from Microsoft is if you're doing ASP.NET Core Web API, stick to Web Host Builder for now. Therefore, you have to account for that behavior difference between those two hosting layers. But just a little hint, because ask me why I know. <laughs> I ran into this problem. <laughs> OK, good. So we have two more minutes. Should I quickly show you value tasks? Yeah. Or any more questions? Okay, so value task. So what what Microsoft recognized is uh, the task the task API. It's an object. Objects get allocated where on the heap. Okay, so they require memory, uh, and it's allocations. Allocations means garbage collection needs to clean it up, right? So what it means is that all the tasks that we're using will, will allocate a lot of objects and therefore for high performance scenarios like for example Kestrel, ASP.NET, this can be a performance problem. Especially in code where you say for example, I have a case where uh, the API is async and in 9 out of 10 times I'm doing synchronous stuff and in just in one case I'm loading th something. What would be such an example? Uh, for example, um, loading stuff from a cache, right? We're saying, um, we're saying, well, whenever we have something in the cache, we Im immediately get it back. When we don't have something in the cache, we load it asynchronously from the database, for example, from Redis or whatever, and then we put it in the cache and then we serve it. So what it means is, in all the cases where we have it in the cache, if we would return here a task, we would still be allocating the task object, okay? With value task, we can say, well, in these cases, its value task is a struct. It's a discriminated union out of the struct, type, uh, uh, out of the, the, the parameter, the struct and the parameter, T result, which is the synchronous path, or a task that only gets allocated if we do asynchronous stuff. So what it means is, when we want to load stuff from the cache, we can then provide the task directly to the value task, and then the value task will take care to execute the task-based version. So that means is, uh, if we execute this code 10 times, we will, um, obviously I made this <coughs> example uh, in that way, we will be nine times on the fast path, which is no allocation of task object, just the int, so we'll be on the stack and not on the heap, which means no garbage collection needs to clean up stuff. And one time, if we load the things, uh, from, from the cache we will be on the async task allocating path, which obviously if we execute this hundreds and thousands and multiple thousand times, this is the way, uh, this is a really uh, efficient way of uh, declaring stuff. I will quickly execute this demo, but it's important. Value task is for really, really high, uh, high performance codes. Most line of business applications are not in that area, so stick to async await and task based API only if you have measured, benchmarked, profiled that it makes sense to use value task, use value task, okay? Because it's also easy to get it wrong, you have to use it in the right way, the API is not that intuitive, okay? But if you have proven it, then you can use it and then you have no longer heap allocations, okay? I'm one minute over time, but I guess that's it. Um, if you're interested, I also prepared uh, a bit more demos. For example, I also looked into uh, system I pipelines and system threading channels. These are new uh, proposed APIs that are coming uh, with uh, .NET Core as extensions. I have samples in there. I if you're interested, uh, that's on the GitHub repository, github.com 
slash Daniel Marbach uh, async.mycore. Uh, I also have business cards here, so if you have more questions in the train back home or at some, at some point, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I have no SLAs on my emails, but I will eventually answer the questions. Feel, feel free to pick a business card and shoot me an email. And I'll stick around a little bit and I will drop out around 11. Hope you liked it. Thanks. Thanks.